Thank you so much for joining us this morning at Samvad. We're very, very happy to welcome you. And today we pay tribute to the founding fathers who created one of the most brilliant documents of the 20th century, the Constitution of India, which ensured adult franchise for all. Um, I would also like to just make a few quick announcements before we get started with our first session to say we're very, very proud that we're presenting Z Entertainment as our title partner this year, and Nexa, who's come on board for the first time as our festival's associate partner. It's very important that we thank our sponsors because we wouldn't be here without them. So thank you for your patience as I just pay tribute to our venue partners, Rajen Kilachand and the Bank of Baroda, JCB Prize for Literature Bookstore, I'm um, sorry, JCB Prize for Literature, and Full Circle, who manage our bookstore, which is over by Charbag, if you do need to buy any books, which we hope you will. Um, we'd also like to thank our cause partners, Detol, Banega Swatch India, Black and White, our celebrations partner, and thank you to Jan Michalski, Aga Khan Foundation, the Getty Foundation, J. Paul Getty Trust, British Council, Nordic Lights, Mahindra Well City, Dove, Airtel, Kingfisher, Grover, CK Birla Hospitals, Avid Learning, and everyone else for believing in the festival and giving us their continued support. Our new partners this year are Population Foundation of India, Child Labor Free Jaipur Initiative, DMI Finance, Dell, Sun Village, Air India, Ola, O2 Sparkle, Swami, and our publishers, Penguin, MIT Press, Westland, Oxford Dictionaries, Murti Classical Library of India, Harvard University Press, and HarperCollins. So the festival, the future of every festival depends on its growing relationship with these, with you, our existing and our new audiences. So we would really like to thank our media partners who help us reach our wider audience, Red FM and Rajasthan's very own Patrika Group, Baskar Group for their generous support year after year, and our new partners, Business Standard, Outlook, and DNA. And finally, our social media partners. Uh, obviously, with Facebook and Twitter, we can increase our reach all around the globe. So thank you to Vayus, Wattpad, and Lonchora for our, our podcast partner. Just a couple of quick housekeeping things before I introduce our wonderful panelists. If you could please, at this very moment, take out your cell phones and please, please put them to silent. It's a matter of respect for our very very kind and esteemed uh, panelists who are joining us today. And if you do get a phone call that you really need to take, please just take it outside. That would be very kind. Um, it's uh, also important that you just don't leave any bags sitting around because we have a, a strong police presence this year um, and we really are being vigilant about anything that's being left on its own so you could cause a security alert. So please just do take care of your bags. And I think um, without any further ado, well, actually one final thing, sorry, the Sangram Colony Gate. That's our nearest emergency exit. So if, you, if there is an emergency and you are here with us in Samvad, you come out and you go across the uh, square in front of us, the plaza, to where the pool bazaar is. And behind the pool bazaar is the Sangram Colony Gate. So if there's any emergency, that's how you get out. Um, Okay, so now I would love to introduce our session. So thank you for joining us for The World's War, Forgotten Soldiers of Empire. And we have joining us today uh, David Olusoga, Rakshanda Jalil, and Nav Navtej Sarna. And I'd like to just tell you a little bit about them before we begin. So uh, David Olusoga is a British Nigerian historian. He's a producer and he's also a presenter. And his book, Civilizations, Encounters and the Cult of Progress, The World's War, won the first World War Book of the Year prize. And his books, Black and British, A Forgotten History and The Kaiser's Holocaust, are also award winners. And he writes for many quality newspapers and publications. And he's even won a BAFTA for his television presentation work and his fabulous programs. We're very happy to have, have him here with us today. And joining him is Raksanda Jalil, She's a, an award-winning translator, critic, and literary historian. She's published over 20 books and written over 50 academic papers and essays. Her book, Delhi, The Invisible City, 
uh, it continues to be a bestseller, and she's translated biographies, novels, and edited a volume of critical writings. She also runs Hindustani Awaz, an organization devoted to Hindi, Urdu literature, and culture. And finally, they will be in conversation with Navtej Sarna, who is the author of novels of the novels *The Exile* and *We Weren't Lovers Like That*. He's also a short, uh, has written a short story collection and many non-fiction works, plus two translations. He's also served as High Commissioner of India to the United Kingdom and Ambassador to Israel and most recently to the United States. So please join me in warmly welcoming our panelists to the stage for our first session here at Samvad. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first session of the third day at ZJLF. Uh, first sessions provide us the opportunity of having a cozy conversation. So I think while people do will trickle in, uh, we won't waste any time, and we will we will start with with the loyal audience that we have got. Uh, thank you, uh, David and Rakshanda, for joining this panel. Uh, to talk about World War I and some of the aspects which are not talked about it too, too often. Could we have silence there, please? It is considered a watershed moment in 20th century, uh, the World War I, its, its uh, start and its end and what it involved. And some of the repercussions of World War I are still seen on the geopolitical politics and, and diplomacy that, that is, I'm sorry, we, we really can't carry on. Sorry, apologies. So the World War I is in many ways a major watershed moment in the 20th century, and some of its repercussions we can still see particularly in the Middle East today. It was essentially a European war, and yet you had literally millions of non-Europeans involved in this war. However, and that's where the two scholars here come in with major contributions, very little is known, uh, even a hundred years on, of the non-Europeans, the non-white people who fought. Who were these soldiers? Did they even know who they were fighting for or what they were fighting for? How did they live? How did they go back to their countries? What was their culture? How, was their, uh, how were their religious sensitivities? respected or otherwise during, during the war. All this and a lot more. Fortunately, considerable work is now being done. A hundred years on, uh, David has done a major work. Rakshanda has just edited a book which talks about Indian, Indian, Indian writings uh, on the war, and of course, she has contributed a major essay uh, of her own. So I'm going to start off straight away, David, by asking you to put this war in context. Uh, how did it come about? How did it happen? And, and so on. Thank you. Well, what's interesting about the First World War is that when it begins in the summer of 1914, there's an absolute determination among the uh, European combatants that this will be what the British called a white man's war. This is a war that takes place near the high water mark of the age of European empire. Most of the world is controlled by uh, uh, European empires. Uh, there's two African nations that aren't part of European empires. 
And yet there is this belief that you can have a war in Europe in this age of empire and somehow exploit the empires but not involve the empires. And that collapses within, within days. Within five days of the British declaration of war, all talk of a white man's war is over because Britain faces a simple arithmetic factor, which is its army is 70,000, the German army is 1.9 million. But Britain has another army, the British Indian army, which is a quarter of a million strong. So within five days, all of this talk of a European war, a white man's war, is over, and the British Indian Army is being gathered to its bases to be sent from Lahore and to be sent from uh, Mumbai across the oceans to fight in Britain. So this, this idea that the age of European warfare where white men can only fight white men is going to continue collapses al almost immediately. But this discomfort with the idea that brown and black men will fight white men. That remains throughout the war. It remains in Germany, who finds it a great affront to white racial unity, that Britain and France are using non-white troops against them. And it remains within Britain, America, and France, because they are uncomfortable with, with what they're doing. Because to allow black men and brown men to fight against white men and kill white men is to undo the basic tenets of, of racial empire, which is that white life is sacrosanct. And that's their problem. They have to try to square this circle. They need non-white manpower, but it undermines the principles on which they built racial empires and racial hierarchies. Thank you. And before I come to Rakshanda, I, I just I wanted to, we would have come down to that point a bit later in the discussion, but I'm so glad you've brought it up. Was there a debate before the non-white people were brought in, in various countries? Uh, or were they just pushed in, uh, just simply in arithmetic calculation? Or was there a debate that this will actually expose the vulnerabilities of the white man? Certainly not in India. I wonder if this is working. Certainly not in India. Uh, Lord Harding, the Viceroy of India, announces that we are at war and India too is at war. So there is no political uh, consultation whatsoever with Indian leaders. Uh, and initially, there is a fair amount of, one could say, enthusiasm. There's certainly enthusiasm from the princely estates who pledge their support, who pledge their loyalty. We even have leaders such as Sarojini Naidu, a Congress leader of great eminence at that point, writing, uh, talking about how we must help out our friend in this hour of need. So initially, uh, the Indian political elite and even the educated middle class Indians feel that this is a time when we must reach out to our friends in need. But I think that perception changes. The war drags on for four years, and, and uh, we'll talk about the political yeah. implications as we go along in this conversation. But um, uh, clearly, in the early days, there is, if not wholehearted support, then certainly, uh, okay, this is our time when we must stand with our friends. Well, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was a uh, enthusiastic recruiter uh, for the First World War. But, but was this entirely a, sort of a friend in need situation or was, it, uh, was there a transactional element to it that maybe we will get something at the end of all this? I think uh, uh, the transactional element comes in uh, as the war drags on. It is Annie Besant who talks about an Indian home rule along the lines of the Irish home rule. It is Annie Besant who really, along with Subramanya Iyer and others, who are planting the idea that India's need can be, uh, sorry, England's need can be India's opportunity. But that is happening, uh, I would say, two years into the war. For the first two years, there is a great deal of recruitment. There are huge amounts of men, material, help. I mean, the, the kind of help that is coming from India is enormous and, and diverse from manganese and mica and iron, minerals that are needed to, uh, for the hardware of war, to, uh, to animals you know, uh, ponies and horses and camels. We are in Rajasthan, so it's appropriate to talk about the help that comes from the princely estates in Rajputana. Bikaner uh, Camel Corps is sent to patrol uh, Sinai and protect Suez. So the princely estates are, uh, as it were, falling over backwards to provide help. Yeah. Perhaps some numbers would be of interest, and please feel free, David, to pop in. But one of the figures that 
comes to my mind, you mentioned animals. I think there were more than 180,000 animals uh, which, which traveled abroad from India. All kinds, uh, and with them came their minders. With their minders, and in the Indian mule, uh, uh, mule uh, regiments, if I can call them that, I think played a very, very critical role. But did you see similar reflection of enthusiasm, David, in the other non-white areas? Perhaps you'd like to define the other nine non-white areas. Well, when Britain goes to war, its empire is dragged to war willingly or unwillingly. So there is a huge amount of enthusiasm in what were sometimes called the white dominions, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, Canada, etc. But there's also enthusiasm in parts of the Caribbean, in Jamaica, a country whose history was founded by British slavery. There is this moment that this feeling in 1914 that this war is an opportunity for the country to show what it's made of, the colony, I should say, and that there will be a, re a reward afterwards. This, I think this idea is repeated across British colonies, that at this moment when England has a need that a display of loyalty will somehow be repaid with better treatment later on. And that in some ways is the sort of tragic contract that people enter into as they send their young men off to war, that there is the presumption that this that all that's been missing is for Britain to understand the loyalty and the qualities of uh, people in these countries and that there will be better treatment. I think there's a certain naivety that the war brings to an end about the fact that this is a racial hierarchical system mm. and it's not going to change, no matter how loyal or how brave you fight. I, I, I would assume that somewhere behind this all is also war as an economic opportunity. Because uh, I, I, I think it's quite obvious that people, certainly the soldiers who, who went out from India, uh, from Punjab, uh, were paid 11 rupees. Uh, and 11 rupees at that time uh, was, was a very, very significant amount of which they could not only spend, uh, but, but also save some. Would you like to add something? You know, very early on in the war, in, 18, uh, in 14 itself, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, a uh, poet, is very quick to see the marriage between empire and trade and commerce. And he writes a long essay in a Bengali journal, which is in response to an editorial. And he points out how, uh, how essentially, I mean, he uses the Baniya system, the caste system in India, to talk about how the world is really divided between Baniyas and others. So he, he's the one who brings our attention to the fact that there is, I mean, it, there is business also here. And others, poets and writers, pick up this. Uh, Navdeep, if I may, I want to read a very short extract, Please. which actually illustrates exactly what we are talking about. Please. This is from Akbar Allahabadi, uh, the poet from Allahabad, um, a, 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 a trenchant criti a critic of uh, colonialism. Uh, may I read the Urdu Please. followed by the English? I think that would be excellent. It's very short. Cheese wo hain jo bane Europe mein. बात वो है जो छपे पायनियर में यूरोप में जो है जंग की कुवत बढ़ी हुई लेकिन फुजून है उसकी तिजारत बढ़ी हुई मुमकिन नहीं लगा सकते हैं हर जगह तोपे देखो मगर पियर्स का है सोप हर जगह सो दिस इज द ट्रांसलेशन रियल गुड्स are those that are made in Europe. Real matter is that which is printed in the pioneer. Though Europe has great capability to do war, greater still is her power to do business. They cannot install a cannon everywhere, but the soap made by peers is everywhere. Excellent. I, I think that, that just shows how so much was going from India. I mean, and Let's remember that there were, there were, there were famines uh, in India, but the grain uh, was, was going to support the war. Uh, and there were, of course, war loans and the war fund and the gift kitty. Uh, and some of the figures are, are staggering. I mean, there's 100 million pounds given as outright gift. Yeah, the gift kitty is a complete euphemism. Yeah. And, and there were 80 million so-called, uh, I think, a figure like that for the war, for the war loans. And, and we must remember that 100 pounds in those days is 34,000 pounds today. 
I think, David, you mentioned that figure in, in your book. Yes. There is. I mean, we, 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 we often see wars as only military events. They're also economic events. So at the governmental level, there's a huge amount of war loans of extra taxation to pay for this war. But it is also, it is the biggest employment opportunity in world history up to that point. And I think w when we think about the First World War, we think about the, the machine guns and the cannons. We also think about the trenches. Now the trench, although not industrial, was one of the most labor intensive forms of warfare. Siege warfare involves engineering and digging and construction on a continental scale. So a great number of the people who become who travel from their lands to become part of this war on the Western Front are auxiliaries. They are laborers as well as soldiers. And they come from all over the world. So by 1917, when America joins, the Western Front is the most diverse place they had ever been. There are people from literally all over the world. When you look at the death statistics of people who get killed on the First World War, if you go down from the list from the people where it's millions down to where it's tens or just hundreds, you will see every country represented. There are Icelanders who die on the Western Front. There are people from Brazil. There are people from countries not involved officially in the war, but men leave because that is where you can rewrite your fate by making money. So this, this construction, the Western Front's 500 miles long, to build this, this incredible network of, uh, of, of tunnels and of trenches, of supply dumps, of communication trenches, involves the labor of the entire world. And people, I mean, Jamaica is a great example. Jamaica is a country, its demographics were created by slavery. Jamaica could never find work for its, its, uh, its manpower. And so whenever there was a great engineering project, like the Panama Canal, Jamaicans left to go and work on it. The Western Front becomes another, another uh, reservoir where people can pour in their labor and make money. So it's not just about the fighting. And so one of the most forgotten people on the Western Front is the Chinese Labor Corps, 150,000, maybe 160,000, depending on which figures you believe. Chinese people volunteer and go to the Western Front to work as laborers, they work as engineers. The tank, the great industrial innovation of the war, it is maintained by the tank corps. The tank corps are mainly Chinese laborers. So you could be from anywhere in the world and you can find yourself on the Western Front. But at some stage, this balance tilts. Uh, economic opportunity is not attractive enough. Some of the letters, certainly in case of India, that come back say that this is not a war, it's the end of the world. Don't come here, they're right back to their villages. And yet, what is happening in India, maybe you'd like to talk about Sir Michael O'Dwyer, is unleashing his recruitment process in Punjab, which is the main source of recruitment at that stage of the war. And uh, the local officials, the Zeldars, the Nambadars, are given quotas that if you don't produce so many people from your village, we'll take your son away to war and similar things. But yeah. do you want to yeah. talk about some of the letters that come back? Sure. Or? Early on in the war, um, in, in 14 itself, a censor board is set up on the battlefield virtually. Now, uh, in a sense, as historians, as researchers, we are glad that this happens because that is our only source of information from the letters. And the letters are very, very revealing. <coughs> Naturally, the letters themselves have not survived, written in broken Urdu or Punjabi. Remember that the bulk of the soldiers were either illiterate or semi-literate. Occasionally, they may have written some letters themselves, but often they would find a friend, a colleague, a comrade to write a letter for them. they were professional them. scribes. They were professional scribes who traveled with the army. So there was that. But having said that, uh, the letters themselves have not survived. We've not found any traces of those letters 100 years later. But we have e translated excerpts from these letters set up by the censor board. And they are correlated by historical accounts. For instance, in 1914 and 15, the casualties are very, very high in France, especially. Uh, the conditions of the trenches, it's bitterly cold, it is wet. Uh, the Indians are ill-equipped to, to deal in that, uh, to live in that weather, to fight effectively. Uh, they talk about how cold and wet and miserable they are. They talk about being used as cannon fodder. This is a term that is being used in Ur Urdu, Hindi, Hindustani, uh, uh, often in the letters. Uh, and uh, 
for instance, people are talking about it is so hard to endure the bombs. Uh, they talk about a shower of bullets and so on. Now, all of this we find uh, is actually uh, picked up by professional historians, by chroniclers, and they talk about that. What was the other thing you wanted me to say? Uh, the, the enforced recruitment. The enforced, yeah. Now, um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, 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 Michael O'Dwyer in the Punjab has allocated quotas for every district. And uh, the Rissaldars, the, the Tehsildars are supposed to meet those quotas. And if they fulfill those quotas, X number of men from each village, they will get some form of uh, a reward you know, uh, um, they'll become a Khan Bahadur, a Rai Sahab, or whatever. So there is, uh, there is a carrot and stick approach here. In the early days, the, in, uh, the enlistments are voluntary to a certain extent, because war uh, is seen as upward mobility by some. Uh, the British have a theory about martial races. They think that certain people are more inclined to be trained to be better soldiers, fighting machines as, the, as it were. And they think that the people from the Punjab uh, are better suited and they've already worked with Punjabi soldiers in the, uh, the Afghan wars, in, in, in China, in the Boxer Revolution. So there has been an experience of Punjabi soldiers doing very well in the British Indian Army. So they want to build on that experience. And from the early days of voluntary, or let's say uh, people who are enticed, we move to a stage where there are forced enlistments, where uh, uh, young men are simply pulled away from their villages and, and taken away. Now, as a literary historian, I am interested in the intersection of literature and history. So in this book, really, I'm talking about how these things that historians have written about is actually picked up by either contemporary writers, people who are writing a short story pretty close during the war years, or even immediately after. Mulkraj Anand writes a big war novel between the two wars. So he's sufficiently close in time to pick on people's you know, oral memories, on testimonies, and villagers that he's known. Mulkraj Anand's own father has worked in the Duke of Connaught's own, uh, and, and so on. So you have people close in time to share their memories of war, and they find reflection in Akshanda, the war. If, uh, I, you know, you mentioned the recruitment. I'd love you to read that uh, little ditty which was used on yes. uh, recruitment yes. posters. Uh, I know you have it in and English. Maybe you could read and, the Punjabi. Uh, I promise you, if you read it out in English, I'll give you the original Punjabi Lovely. one. Lovely. A lot of folk songs were written. They talk about Vira. Many of you may have heard this song in the film A Rockstar. Katiya karu me katiya karu. I'm by myself spinning the wheel. So women whose men, husbands or sons or brothers had gone away would form these little groups where they would spin and they would sing songs. So we have Vira separation songs sung by women, but we also have popular ditties that make fun of the forced en uh, enlisters. And while the great many that we have come from Punjab, but they come from Uttar Pradesh, they come from Bengal, we have uh, Bangla songs of uh, en uh, uh, enlisters being called red-faced monkeys, for instance. The one I'm going to read in translation is from Punjabi. Uh, this says, in translation it says, the recruits are at your doorstep. Here you eat dried roti, there you will eat fruit, here you are in tatters, there you'll wear a suit, here you wear worn out shoes, there you'll wear boots. Well, uh, for the Punjabis in the audience, I, I think I'll read this out. He says, Parti hoja ve bar khade rang root, ethe khame sukki hoi roti, othe khame fruit, ethe pame fate hoi lide, othe pame suit, ethe pame tutti hoi jutti, othe pame boot. So this idea of uh, upward mobility of a better life, we find from literary sources, occasionally works out for some. Certainly it is a coming of age experience, certainly it is a rite of passage, and many novelists talk about how young men from landlocked Punjab board a ship from Karachi, travel on a ship, 
Um, and the ship and they used to run away also. They would often run away, yes. And course. I think wasn't that they were the deserters. yeah? There was a similar experience when the French were recruiting in France in in Africa. Well, the, the French have their own equivalent of the British martial racist theory. The French have a concept called the force the noire. Even before the First World War, a uh, French general, Charles Mongin, had concluded that the answer to the demographic disparity between France and Germany, Germany was then 80 million, um, was to deploy the African soldiers of the French African Empire to bring them into the French army, train them, and deploy them on the battlefields. So France already has over 30 divisions of 30 regiments of North African and West African soldiers at the beginning of the war, and they are deployed immediately. In the declaration, the, the French mobilization order that's posted all over the country, it mentions specifically the colonial soldiers are also to be, to be mobilized. But the French have been recruiting the Force Noire, the Black Army, on the principles of uh, la race guerrière, that some, some African soldiers, some African tribes are more warlike than others. But this is the age of social, of social Darwinism. This is the age of pseudoscientific racism. And it becomes clouded in this deeply disturbing forms of racial thinking. French doctors conv convince themselves that Africans can sustain injuries and wounds that would kill white soldiers. They convince themselves Africans don't feel pain physically the same way that Europeans do, that they are naturally animalistic and therefore capable of suffering burdens that would kill white soldiers. And so within this principle of the force, le, le, le race carrière, is not only the idea that Africans should be recruited, but that they should be used and deployed in certain ways, mm -hmm. that Africans don't feel the shock of battle the way Europeans do, so they should be used as shock troops. They should be in the first wave of attack. As a result, your chances of dying on the Western Front if you're a West African soldier are higher than if you're a white French soldier. Because a French African expert, uh, anthropologist, has decided that your ethnic groups means you are naturally warlike. These theories of race lead to your life chances being curtailed. This is not stuff that lives that stays in books. This determines who lives and who dies, so both in India and in Africa. So we actually are seeing two parallel things happening here. And, that's and also, the French do what the British do in India. Yeah. They decide who these ethnic groups who are. They, yeah. so they, uh, they come and they, they, they create divisions within ethnic groups that no one from those ethnic groups would recognize, a bit like the British do in Nepal when they decide who should be recruited into the Gurkhas and who not. Some of these divisions that they impose on the Nepalese people are British inventions. They are people come with these racial theories and they see divisions which they have invented themselves. Well, and, and, and you see why, and, and these get swallowed also because on the one hand you see this whole romanticizing the martial races. They romanticize the Sikh troops and re, re, reaching Marseille and you know the, how the people are impressed by the turbans and the beards and the slouch hats of the Gurkhas and, and uh, how uh, the French women are bringing flowers on the street. So that's all the romance. At, on the other side is the racism behind it, that you build up this theory that you are good to die. So you push these people in front. So as, so as, but I, I think this is very interesting. How was race actually handled uh, on, on the battlefield? Uh, I mean, I, I know we haven't talked about it yet, but, but you do mention in your book how African Americans not the Africans themselves. African Americans came there and simply served as labor? Oh. It, no, it's, um, in some ways what the First World War does is it shows the illogic of race. It forces imperial powers and America to, to confront racial encounters that they've done everything to avoid. So the British, in their jumble of illogic, the British decide that Indian soldiers can fight on the Western Front that African soldiers can't. The British never recruit African soldiers the way the French do, although there is a big movement led by Winston Churchill in Parliament that Britain should recruit what they call the Million African Army, but they, ne they never do. So Indians can fight, but Africans can only come to the Western Front to labor. The West Indian regiments are brought to the Western Front. Again, they're only allowed to labor, but they are allowed to fight in the Middle East against the Turks. At the heart of this is always this discomfort. Race in the imperial context is the great dividing line. 
you don't want to put guns in the hands of people who you distrust. Mm -hmm. And so arming men in the Caribbean, in Africa, is something the British find very, very difficult to do. They partly find it difficult because the white South Africans are entirely opposed to Africans being trained to fight. It gets even more strange with the African Americans. They recruit 10% of their army as non-white, as African Americans, but they don't want them to fight. They put them in the service corps. But in order to try to create um, morale within the African American community to make them feel a part of the war, they are allowed to fight, but only as members of the French army. So African American soldiers go to war in the uniforms and with the arms of the French army. And there is two regiments who do fight on the Western Front, but under French command. And they, white American officers wouldn't have anything to do with them. You have this, a lot of the illogic, and race by its nature is illogical, a lot of the illogic of race is forced and into stark relief on the Western Front because of this pressure of war means the normal rules of empire, the normal rules of race have to be suspended. But what everybody is thinking about during the war is how, when this comes to an end, do we put people back in their place? And mm. what you see the moment the war is over is a concerted effort to tell black and brown people that your service in this war doesn't count for anything. It hasn't changed anything. It's not going to give you better treatment. It's not going to uh, make us rewrite the rules of empire. This, this is about harvesting your labor and your blood. Is a similar experience in very, India? Yes, very. You know, and race it is a big thing, of course. Uh, they are forced to put a gun in the hands of Indian soldiers, while, of course, a great many are animal minders and vet veterinarians, they're doctors, they're other things, but the great majority of Indians. And the numbers are huge, 1.3 million Indians, of whom 74,000 never make it back home. They just die in the various war arenas scattered across the globe. So of these 1.3 million, uh, the great majority are fighting men. So they and have very, to. They, and they're very brave. They're, they're 11 very, Victoria they're, yes, Crosses. Yes, 11. The first one goes to Khudadat Khan from the Punjab. And it goes on. So there's no questioning their loyalty. There's no questioning their, their, their trustworthiness. All that is there. Race comes out in a thousand different ways. I don't have the time to give you many examples. Let me give you just one. When it comes to the wounded being sent to the hospitals in Brighton, there is a big issue. What about the nurses? Can we have white m women looking after brown wounded soldiers? So uh, initially they try to make do with male nurses, but then that doesn't quite work out. So then they work out this logic that, well, again, there is class, there is caste, there is color. Everything is at play even during the war. Then they figure out that, um, uh, that an educated uh, but middle class English woman is all right. And the nurses indeed are mostly from the middle class. So there's a class factor there. But that is after a long time. Initially, they want to make do with just male nurses. Yeah, and I think that's a very important point, And that's why work that all of you are doing is, is, is so important today. Because not only is there color, there's a gradation of color. Yeah. Uh, brown is a little more acceptable than black. Uh, and the brown soldiers can be given uh, guns a little more easily. So but it's interesting that in the case of the British Indian Army, Britain has no choice in 1914 but to deploy the Indian Army. The moment Britain has recruited its own volunteer army, remember it goes to war with an army of 70,000 professional soldiers. At the end of the war, it has 5 million men at arms. Once it has recruited a volunteer army, the Indians at the end of 1915 are sent to the Middle East because to fight against the Ottoman Turks is more acceptable because that's brown people killing brown people. So Britain does allow the Indian army to fight on the Western Front, but the moment it has an alternative, it takes them away. It's and never comfortable with it. And uh, I, I know we're going to soon open up for the audience, uh, but I think it's very interesting how this is not easily accepted even by the opponents. Uh, it's fascinating that Germany actually puts in a formal protest to, the Brit to Britain and to France that, listen, you, you can't do this. You can't bring in uh, blacks and browns onto Europeans and to fight your war against us. It sounds a bit like, uh, you know, at a cricket match with a tennis ball, you say, hey, no, no cricket ball, no fast bowling, you know. It, it sounds a bit like that. So, uh, 
Well, it's interesting. In 1914, when the German army first begins to encounter French, North African, West African soldiers, and then the British Indian army, it sees their presence on the European battlefield as a symbol of the weakness of Britain and France. And the propaganda message is, look, our enemies are so weak, they're having to use these inferior people to fight. Once the Western Front forms at the end of 1914, and it's clear that the war is not going to be over very, very quickly, and that this is a long struggle, this is exactly the war Germany didn't want, a war on two fronts, a war of trenches and siege, then they change their propaganda tactics, and they see the presence of these non-white, supposedly inferior peoples as racial betrayal. And Germany writes a, a series of... Uh, propaganda reports and messages aimed very much at the United States to show that this is the ultimate betrayal of the white race, that Britain and France can't fight a civilized war because they're using uncivilized people to do it. If you look at German political and satirical cartoons from the, from the First World War, they are dripping with racial hatred. It's powerful. They show cartoons of Indian soldiers and African soldiers with exaggerated features. There are reports put around that the Indian soldiers cut the heads off uh, German soldiers. And they soldiers. drink blood. They drink blood. That, they, uh, that the Gurkhas with the Kukri knife are um, decapitating soldiers and carrying the heads around and the ears around. This idea that, the, that a savagery has been brought into the heart of Europe is a propaganda campaign that the Germans keep, keep going at. But talking of propaganda, I think uh, you mentioned the Royal Brighton Pavilion Hospital, yeah. which in unidimensional pictures today seems like such a magnanimous, magnanimous thing on behalf of Britain to do for the Indian wounded soldiers, but it was so infested with uh, race, race questions. But the aspect of propaganda I wanted to bring in you, Rakshanda, is the Germans also did a lot of propaganda to, amongst the prisoners of war to get them to fight a jihad, uh, the Muslim soldiers, yeah. that would they, would they take up the Khilafat cause and would they then turn against the British? Could you talk about that? Yeah. They're actually not just the Khilafat. There is, remember, there is the, also the Ghadarites. Mm. From 1907, 1910, 11, 12, there have been a series of mutinies, revolts, especially in the Punjab. There's a group of activists called the uh, political activists called the Ghadarites. Ghadar meaning revolt, rebellion. And they have been, as it were, fomenting uh, unrest within the Punjab. But then many of them are sent away in exile or they choose to leave India and go away. And there are strong pockets all across Europe. They are especially strong in Germany. What they do is that they, with the help of the German forces, they scatter pamphlets and materials in, written in Punjabi, in Urdu, among the Indian soldiers in the trenches. So we have large numbers of pamphlets, uh, as it were, inciting rebellion, uh, uh, encouraging sedition, encouraging them to sort of uh, rise and revolt against their colonial masters. So the Ghadarites are active in Germany and, 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 and France and so on. And then we come to the Middle East where another kind of dilemma is, is putting the Indian Muslim soldiers in particular uh, in, in, in kind of disarray. Having said that, I don't want to uh, want this to be understood to mean that there is, a, there is a question mark on their loyalty or their bravery. However, when Europe, uh, when, when Turkey enters the war, and it enters the war fairly early on, the Indian Muslims begin to feel that whose side do we now Sort of, you know, uh, that this is an entry point. This is a point where we can enter the minds of people and say, this is not a just war. How can you be fighting? So, uh, I'm not suggesting that this becomes a, a Hindu Muslim question, fortunately. In, in fact, if anything, the war foments a great deal of Hindu Muslim unity. Yeah. If and anything. there was just one small mutiny down in Singapore. In, in and, Singapore, and there, there is a mutiny. There wasn't too much yes. uh, impact. But before we turn this over to the audience, I know we have 
15 minutes for questions. I want a very brief comment from each one of you, uh, and you can choose the arena you want to address, is the war ends, the soldiers go home. Uh, the political leaders have done their bit. Is there a reward or is there complete disappointment? I think there's a concerted effort to rebuild the walls of racial division and racial hierarchy that have been temporarily susp suspended by the war. The example of the African-American soldiers is, is a, a useful one. The African-Americans who fought and labored on the Western Front returned home in 1918, 1919, 1920, full of hope that this will buy them uh, a better deal. Remember, African-Americans had fought in the Civil War for the Union in the hope that as well as winning the end of slavery, they would win some sort of equality. There is a concerted effort by politicians in the South and by the population of much of the South to make sure that African Americans get nothing out of this war. As a result, the wearing of your uniform, which is a soldier in the American army, you have a right to do three months after demobilization. African American soldiers who return home to the South are met at the train stations by white gangs and they are stripped of their uniforms. 13 African American soldiers are killed. They are lynched, hanged, mutilated in America after the First World War by the Ku Klux Klan for wearing their uniform. There is a warning put out by a senator from Mississippi called Vardman who warns African American soldiers that they have been spoilt by contact with France and French liberty and French women and that they are going to be taught a lesson of where they really stand. And he advocates in his own private newspaper for a wave of lynching of African American soldiers. What happens to the African American soldiers is not dissimilar to what happens to South Africans, black South African laborers who return home. The British um, West India Regiment when they are um, demobilized, they're sent to a base in Italy where they are not given the same rights as white soldiers. When they protest, when they mutiny, they are then, the ringleaders are shot and executed and the regiment is disbanded. At the end of the war, the game is about re-establishing white racial unity, not about rewarding brown and black men for their service. And a similar thing in India. Well, uh, the war is also a coming of age experience for in the Indian political leadership. Uh, while initially they are supporting the war, they're encouraging enlistments. Uh, midway through the war, they start talking about greater political representation, about some form of self-governance, they talk about self-rule, and, and so on. But uh, by the end of the war, if I were to see taken in the balance, I think the war, I think the one good thing that comes out of the war is a kind of a mature leadership. Um, there, there is talk of reforms. Uh, Britain uh, puts forward the Montego reforms. It's tabled in 17. By the time it becomes an act, it's already 19. So if we see the benign form of colonial rule in the Montego reforms, we see the other harsher draconian phase in something else, which is the Rowlett Act. So it's like you're giving with one hand and then you're taking back everything again. So Punjab breaks out in unrest. We have the Jallianwala Bagh in April 1919. And Punjab in particular, while the rest of the country too feels cheated, but it is Punjab that says, we gave you our sons, we gave everything to this war, and we are asking for something, and we're not getting that. And the Urdu poets that I've picked up in my book are talking about the crumbs that from the rich man's table, and how there are toadies in this country, toady is a word that is suddenly being used uh, by the, the poets, how there are toadies who are willing to crawl on their bellies to pick up those crumbs, but even those crumbs vanish with the coming of the Rowlett attack, and we have Jallianwala Bagh. So that much it's ironic that this was called the Great War for Democracy. This was the result. Uh, we'll throw it open. Questions, comments? Brigadier Joda. I think the first question should rightly go to the person whose grandfather fought in the First World War as a liberator, one of the liberators of Haifa. Thank you, sir. Uh, very interesting talk, and thank you for that. Uh, I just wanted to ask, at the beginning of August 1914, when the war broke out, uh, the, there was a lot of competition kind of a thing between the princes also. They wanted to outdo each other, and uh, everyone wrote to the Viceroy Hardinge that their regiment should be given the chance to go and fight in France. And uh, I remember that uh, Maharaja Regent of Jodhpur, Sir Pratap Singh, uh, when his uh, regiment was selected to go for the war, and it was uh, initially for the defense of the Suez Canal, but he insisted that no, it's a secondary theater of war, 
uh, my regiment should be given the chance to go to France. And this perhaps Jodhpur Lancers was the only Imperial Service Cavalry Regiment to remain in France for three and a half years because every rest of the regiments of the even, even they pulled out uh, to the Palestine and Egypt uh, theater. Uh, what I wanted to ask was ki, uh, they did quite well. But when the soldiers came back, uh, giving the example of the Jodhpur Lancers, uh, they were promised so much, uh, land, jangi in arms, jagis. Uh, uh, there was a rebellion in Jodhpur when they came back in July 1920. For five days, the Jodhpur Lancers men who were given acting promotions during the war, they were promised so much, they were given free rations during the war, they were all stopped because the state couldn't pay that much. Their pay and promotions were made equivalent to the Indian Army. Uh, even my grandfather was given a Jagir, but I don't know where that Jagir is. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I feel it was quite a letdown for the soldiers yeah. after the war. Yeah. Thank you. Good. I think that's... I think it varied across states. Hyderabad did slightly better. The Nizam was more generous with the rewards because also I think his his share in the kitty was the largest from Hyderabad. That young lady there? Hi, uh, thank you for such a lovely session. Uh, I would like to bring things more into contemporary times. Uh, there was an incident in uh, England where uh, a uh, Sikh soldier's uh, statue was desecrated lately and uh, from the First World War. And there's still very little recognition about the entire thing. Uh, do you think it's still racism or embarrassment on the part of uh, these guys? Well, uh, if I'll just make a brief comment on that. And if I, I, think, I, I think it's a valid point you make because there is a still somewhere a certain hesitation in accepting this as our war. Uh, and this, even when the celebrations of the 100 years started, there were some questions raised that this was a colonial war, these people were mercenaries. Uh, I think, frankly, a lot more study will bring out the actual truths and we will forget these, these kind of biases. Let's just remember one thing. Uh, that this was Indian blood that was shed in foreign battlefields. And we need to use the centenary to respect that and, and to honor that. And whatever may have been the reasons for the enlistment, in many cases possibly it was mercenary, it was upward mobility and so on. Having said that, I think it led to a greater awareness, it led to Indians traveling abroad, it led to a kind of certain maturity, a certain political maturity at a national level. Right there. Broken knee. Um, I go back to your comment about current racism, even in almost every war, World War II, the Vietnam War in America it was very racist and class conscious. I just spent some time up in Nagaland and I'd be so interested in future writings, if you would take a look at what happened in World War II and what a pivotal, pivotal role the Nagas played in the eventual outcome of the World War II. You know, as a Westerner, I had not a clue until I actually went up there. And I think more awareness of the role of this small tribal community on the outcome of the world would be really, really helpful for those of us who are so ignorant about the whole, whole thing. Thank you. David, would you take that? I, I know more about their, their service in the, in the First World War, but I think all of the, there had been wars before that you that you could think of as as world wars. The Seven Years' War took Britain and France all over the all over the world. What's different about the First World War is its sheer manpower demands. The fact that the British are recruiting in the hills of India, that the, the French are recruiting in the forests of West Africa, it means that people were dragged from lives. That where they could not have imagined what the Western Front was like. And the Naga are one of these people. There's a British, um, a British journalist sees Naga, some Naga uh, laboring on the Western Front, and he's, he reflects on how the British had been telling them that their inter-tribal inter conflicts were barbaric. And then he wonders what they make of the Western Front and the hypocrisy of 
the British policing people for their, their military traditions and then sending them to the Western Front. Well, uh, All we things. have a lot of other questions. I don't think we have the time. What I'm going to ask is three or four questions be asked, very short questions, and then we'll see how we can answer these in one quick go. There are lots of people. Uh, a gentleman there wanted to ask a question. Oh, there's a microphone there. Okay. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, you mentioned that the Congress were active recruiters in the World War, and I wanted to know how did they stand with their inherent philosophy of nonviolence, and how did the press, both in India and Britain, respond to okay. that? Okay, at the back there. This side. Thank you so much. Uh, just wanted to ask you a little insight if you could give on to how uh, did the First World War affect the spread of the Fran Spanish flu? That is one. And, and, and just a little uh, question that I wanted to, in fact, that was answered. That she, she had asked the other young lady over there. I've been very closely associated with the Khadiki War Cemetery, uh, being part of the CWGC, et cetera. The last year, 2018, we tried to celebrate the Armistice Day, the centenary, in fact. And I'm an army officer myself, but uh, I, was, I must say that I was quite uh, sad by the, by, the, by the response from my establishment and also by the government. And we had a private affair in the end. Thank you. At the end, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Nabdej. I'm General Ghosh. I commanded a very old battalion uh, of the Indian Army, three guards. It was raised in 1775, and we have 28 battle honors, out of which six were in Mesopotamia during the First World War. I just want to make three comments on this, is that we fought the entire war, and by the end of the war, we had been decimated totally. My entire battalion had been decimated, and it was recuperated many times, I guess. At one time, uh, they were starving. They had nothing to eat. I had to request you to... Yeah, but it's very important yeah. because uh, we talked about mercenaries. We were not mercenaries, that's what I'm going to say. Good point. And yeah. we had to get back permission from the Imam of Jama Masjid to eat horses. And then only we could eat horses to survive. And the last point, we talked about the Muslims. We had Muslims in our battalion. When the battalion was captured, the Turkish Emir, our Sobita Major, was a Muslim. He said, look, you come to our side, bring all your Muslim soldiers, and you'll have a much better life with us. Asubhita Major threw his sword at the face of the Emir and said, Naam, Nishan, Namak. So that's what I'm telling you. We were not mercenaries. We have a very, very proud history of fighting as a battalion. Good point. Sir, quick sir uh, with quick all quick due respect, responses, yeah, yeah. please. Anything you want. The Spanish flu? The Spanish flu. Uh, well, there's a session this, and this afternoon about the Spanish flu, that, uh, uh, w which I advise you to come to, and we can answer that question there with Laura, who's an expert, just written the major book on the flu. I think the use of the word mercenary is an unfortunate one, uh, but having said that, I think uh, I was trying to say that maybe it was not all, they were not professional soldiers, and uh, the enlistment machinery and system was a crude one. Yes, and I think uh, your question about Mahatma Gandhi uh, or the Congress, you said what we meant. Mahatma Gandhi is actually uh, working on, on, on the idea that the war would make it easier for Indians to get a fair deal. And he felt that the recruitment at that stage was, was, a, useful, uh, was a useful step. He did change his views thereafter, after the war. And the issue of non-violence and Mahatma Gandhi's approach to it is a very complicated one, which I cannot explain in the 20 seconds or so that we have. Uh, do we still have time? We have to wrap it up. Uh, we'll all be around here, and if there are any more questions, we're happy to catch up. Thank please, you. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. We'd like to present each of you with a scarf to say thank you so much for your time. 
and thank you for your patience. The authors will be going up to the author signing desk if you'd like to ask your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody. Um, just up the ramp outside Samvad tent, there is a table and that's the author book signing uh, station.